So Alexander Pope is an amazing poet and he's from a time period where generally, personally, I don't actually like the poetry of that time period. Um, so it's called the Age of Enlightenment, it's kind of the 1700s. It's not my favourite time period personally for literature or art or that kind of thing. But Pope's a weird one because I just, despite him being from that time, I love him and I think he's awesome. And um, yeah, he had a really strange life and he was a really unusual person. So if you find this lesson interesting and you're kind of interested in the ideas of Alexander Pope generally, he's worth looking into as a person and it's worth reading some of his other poems that are also really famous. Another one that's um, really, really good is called um, Eloise to Abelard and it's based on the letters that this nun and monk who fell in love, who couldn't be together, wrote to each other. And it has uh, this line about eternal sunshine of the spotless mind, which actually formed the basis of a really good film that I love as well. So you might have heard that line, eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. So yeah, that's another recommendation by him. This one is a section of a longer text called an essay on criticism. And you do need to understand what criticism is. So I'm going to start there, but bear in mind as well, because it's called from an essay on criticism, this is a section of something that is much longer. It's actually a really brilliant poem and it's a work of genius. So my aim for this lesson is to convince you that this guy's very, very clever and funny. So criticism is the sort of feedback that people give on art, if we think about it that way, and not just paintings, but like any art form or any creative form in general. So we need to be critical. If you're critical of something, you can help improve it and you can kind of help people to understand what's good about it, why it's good, how it's useful. So critics are people that review things. They write, you know, a book review or a film review or a review of paintings and they tell us in a bit more detail what's really great about it. They help us to kind of see that artwork more clearly. But they also have a bit of a bad rep. So they, they have this kind of reputation that critics see themselves as quite smug and superior to creatives. And um, yeah, quite often people really get annoyed by <laughs> critics and the fact that they feel like, you know, their saying goes or however they, um, however they are really, they'll like basically, I don't know, make or break someone's entire career or they might, um, decide that they're going to pick up a person and make them super famous overnight. So you, you'll be aware of this in, in the modern world as well. There might be musicians or artists that have just gone from no one knows them one minute to the next minute, they're everywhere. Partly that's the work of media, but also criticism as part of the media. So in Pope's day, because it's a very, you know, this type of Criticism is really well respected, so literary critics have a lot of power in his day. Um, yeah, the, the critics, the people who told you what to think about a writer or about a poem, they had tons of power. And they would always, you know, tell people whether something was good or not so people couldn't decide for themselves. So Pope got very annoyed by this, which is why I love him. And he just thought it wasn't fair. He thought that critics themselves maybe needed to be criticized. So he made what essentially is like a, a meta poem, which is an essay in the form of a poem that is criticizing the critics themselves. So he's reviewing as a poet, the critics and whether they're actually worth listening to, which uh, I think is just genius. It's really funny, really clever. Um, yeah, really amazing way to engage with that type of thing. So this is actually one of my absolute favorite sections of the poem as well. So I'm going to read it aloud to you and um, you can just take a minute to have a look at the vocabulary, make sure that you understand that. I took these little designs from books that, that Pope had actually written as well. So like these old ones, you find them in the actual books that Alexander Pope printed. Um, so yeah, just have a look at this vocab for a second, and then I'm going to read the poem aloud for you. Feel free to pause and look back at it if you need loads of time there. 
<laughs> just clear my throat as well because I've been drinking water, but I've, I've filmed quite a lot of lessons in a row and I forget how my voice just starts disappearing eventually. So it's, I think it's got to like fading away point now. <laughs> okay, put my reading voice on. A little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or taste not the Pyrene spring. There, shallow drafts intoxicate the brain and drinking largely sobers us again. <laughs> Sorry, my voice. Drinking largely sobers us again. Fired at first sight with what the muse imparts. In fearless youth, we tempt the heights of arts. Well, from the bounded level of our mind, short views we take, nor see the lengths behind. But more advanced, behold, with strange surprise, new distant scenes of endless science rise. Science in this case means knowledge, doesn't mean science in the modern way that we use this word. So pleased at first the towering Alps we try, mount o'er the vales and seem to tread the sky. The eternal snows appear already past, and the first clouds and mountains seem the last. But those attained we tremble to survey the growing labours of the lengthened way. The increasing prospect tires our wandering eyes. Hills peep over hills and Alps on Alps arise. So that might sound like absolute gobbledygook to you and uh, yeah, older poetry will do that to you if you're not used to the language of it, so it takes a little while. It's kind of like if you read Shakespeare and you've never studied Shakespeare, it's just nonsense. Um, I'm going to go through what that means in more plain English now. I've actually written a little summary here, so we'll just kind of jump to the summary. So only learning something a little. I actually read this when I was at school and I've lived by this principle my whole life and it has served me very well. So highly recommend uh, whatever stage you're at in your life that you follow this rule as well. A little learning is dangerous. You need to de drink deeply from the fountain of knowledge, the Pyrian spring. Otherwise your education is worth nothing. So if you know a little bit about something, say, you know, there's a topic you're debating with someone and you go spend an hour researching it on the internet and you come back and you feel like you just are an expert that's not going to serve you very well. If you really want to know something and understand it, you need to consistently focus yourself and, uh, you know, go back to it multiple times, read it and learn about it from different angles, think about it deeply and give yourself time to mature as well before you feel like you fully understand something. Um, Shakespeare says, a fool thinks himself to be wise, but a wise man knows himself to be a fool. And I always really love that quote as well. So it's a similar idea. Um, you know, if you think you're really clever and you know everything, you're probably not. If you're very humble and you realize there's so much more to learn than you already know, even if you feel like you're an expert at something, you always have more to learn. That's a much better way to be in life. So hopefully that idea makes sense to you. Education is pointless if we just know a bit and we suddenly think we're experts because that's not what education is about. Small drinks of the Pyrene spring, which is the fountain of knowledge, it's a metaphor. Um, they leave the brain drunk and confused, but when we drink deeply, we start to think clearly. So if you really understand something deeply, then you have a clarity to what you know. If you just know it a little bit, you'll feel confused or you, you'll feel like you know it. But if anyone actually questions or presses you on it, you'll start getting a little bit stressed because you'll realize that you don't know. Happens sometimes if you start debating with people or arguing and they have really strong opinions. But if you uh, sort of challenge the opinion, they get angry or stressed. That's usually a sign that they don't actually know their own opinion well enough, that they've not got enough knowledge. It doesn't necessarily mean their opinion's wrong. It just means they're feeling challenged because they don't have enough knowledge. So when we first see the muse of creativity, this is like when we're you know, young and we're starting out being a creative person, doing something creative with our lives and we're inspired, which is what the muse of creativity is about. The inspiration she provides fires us up, makes us young, uh, you know, fearless when we're young. I never actually had this. I was always crippled by the feeling that I was awful at creative stuff for a long time. And I've recently started being creative. So if you don't feel like this, that's also fine. <laughs> uh, 
um, it's it's totally valid to be the other way with creativity where you feel like you're totally not worthy and then eventually you get more confident with yourself and you're like actually I can write a poem or I can paint a picture um, so yeah it's taken me 32 years to get to a point where I feel okay about that so yeah other people that are creative if they're kind of like you know confident people they might feel fired up and inspired and they um they just start you know producing things being inspired making poems making art being creative so yeah this is definitely how pope felt in his own youth he felt sorry there's a skype noise going now so <laughs> this lesson's slightly a shambles my voice isn't working the skype noise is going hopefully you're roughly following with this one so yeah when you're young and fearless you make art and you kind of think you know everything you're very inspired and fired up but you can only see a short distance ahead of you and it looks like you're just trying to climb a mountain and you think if i can get to the top of the mountain it'll be fine and so you know you you're really energized you work really hard you get to the top of your mountain this is obviously an extended metaphor for creativity and how it works once you get to that mountain top you look and there's a million more mountains to go so actually you know once you understand the depth that lies behind your creative discipline and the depth needed to produce great art it feels so much more vast and uh, daunting than it did at first so art can feel like you climb a mountain you get to the top you realize there's 10 more mountains to go something like that um, so yeah, scenes of endless knowledge rise before us. So it's all about kind of, you know, the more we learn, the more we can reflect back in our art as well. So nowadays, sometimes people think, when I say art, I mean any artistic discipline. So it could be music, poetry, um, painting, drawing, tattooing, design, <laughs> pretty much anything that's creative in any way. So yeah, people nowadays think that you know they just have a right to create things anything they make is just valid straight away but actually in the past which i agree with more there was more of a tradition of um you know learning a lot before you actually had the right to be creative so you learn your discipline so he's talking about this here he's saying if you want to be a musician need to learn like not necessarily tons of music theory but you need to learn a lot about whatever kind of music you want to make before you can actually be a musician or you know a writer or a painter so it's it's a constant lifelong dedication that you have to your artistic craft and you keep going with it the older and more advanced we are we know that there are there's almost endless knowledge almost infinite knowledge that anyone could you know it would take a lifetime to learn and more so we tremble we're frightened because we realize it's a lot more hard work than we even thought and we already used all our energy getting up that first mountain and so we get tired and you know there's just mountains and mountains ahead of us hills and hills to go so it's sort of that emotional roller coaster that goes along with creativity, the ups and downs of being inspired, being motivated, being demotivated, feeling like you're not good enough, there's too much to learn, there's too much to go. Um, so yeah, he's, he's really captured that process of creativity here really well, and the kind of positives and negatives, ups and downs of it. So he's speaking about universal truths that underlie artistic practices. Again, art's not just painting or, or drawing, it's all artistic or creative disciplines. And he's also trying to give us as individuals a guidance about the importance of education and study to creating good art. He wants us to be moderate. We don't want to be over, overly egotistical or ambitious in youth. We don't want to think that the first hill that we climb is the only hill we need to climb. So I've spent quite a lot of time, <coughs> sorry, again, my throat, um, quite a lot of time going through the, uh, you know, the meaning and the themes of this poem. I'm going to give you a little bit of time to just pause and have a look at the language and structure devices here. 
there are a lot of language devices, so I've only put a few here, but um, you need to kind of look through in more detail yourself as well. You'll notice there's a lot of imagery, for example. There's a lot of symbolism as well. The most important one out of the language is the extended metaphor. So make sure that you're quite happy with that. <laughs> Everything's all like my whole, uh, my whole lesson is just like constantly bombarded by stuff. I filmed about, I think maybe three or four lessons in a row and they've all been perfect and silent and quiet and nothing popping up, no noises. My voice has been fine. And then this one's just like everything all at once. So yeah, I apologize for the slightly scruffy nature of this lesson. It's not quite my most perfect lesson. Um, but I'm determined to continue because Pope is really good and we should learn about him and his ideas. And also, if you're a creative person, it's actually genuinely very good life advice. Um, so yeah, heroic couplet, important structural aspect. Make sure you understand that as well. He's actually really well known for heroic couplets. So um, a lot of Pope poems use these couplets. And also understand the form of Horatian satire. So who Horace is, you might want to even look that up as a separate thing and go away and research Horatian satire so that you understand Horace, you understand satirical writing, and then you see where this comes from. Um, so yeah, the whole poem, An Essay on Criticism, is a satire. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't contain truths as well. So this is a section of that poem that I feel is being quite honest as well. It's maybe a bit over the top about, you know, not everyone is like young and egotistical and thinks they're an amazing artist. Like I was saying, it's, it's a certain type of person that he's satirizing there, which is probably similar to how he was himself. So some clear attitudes here. Um, yeah, they're all about creativity and also spirituality. So the divine world is present in nature but the artist must access the divine to produce great art. So this idea that art doesn't only just come from our inner self. Like nowadays we really have this, you know, a lot of artists make art and it's just about them. And I actually love painting and music that explores an individual or kind of talks about, someone kind of talks about themselves and explores themselves in the art. I think that's really valuable. But I think it's only valuable if you can connect it to this kind of um, universal meaning that, that applies to us all. And when you do that, you're kind of accessing the spiritual or the divine. You're accessing this idea of like, you know, the collective. So instead of it just being about that person, it's got, you know, usefulness for everyone that listens to that song or reads that poem or looks at that painting. So contextually, he was, yeah, he's an amazing translator, actually, of old classical work. So if you're ever studying, you know, something like the Iliad, um, he did an amazing version of the Iliad, which I love. So, yeah, if you if you study classics or you ever read like classical literature, um, see if Pope's done a translation of what you're reading, because his versions are always my favorite, I think. He was very sick when he was young and um, he had sent a grocer. So he was tiny, bless him. He was four foot six tall and um, he was generally quite sickly and ill. So in some ways this kind of crippled his life and made, made it difficult for him to travel or do things that he wanted to do. But in other ways, actually, it was a blessing in disguise because he spent all his time reading, learning, educating himself. Um, and he became, you know, extremely intelligent. And then he also was very creative. So um, he designed his own villa and uh, it's really cool, the pictures of it. So you can, you can look at his own uh, villa. He designed the gardens and he turned the garden into kind of like a play area, like an adult play area for, I don't know, camera obscura type thing or a grotto or those kinds of weird features that he has in his in his garden, so it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, I really like this little contextual anecdote as well. He wrote this when he's 23, so he's not old. <laughs> it makes it sound like he's really old and kind of over the hill and he's he's learned so much since he started, 
you know, he was young and foolish, but actually he's only 23 years old. Um, so he's still pretty young himself. And he wrote this, he's maybe trying to force himself to mature. And he's looking back on his creative output of the last five years or so thinking, actually it's, you know, it could be better because it's immature in certain ways. So when you're ready, you can make a few little mind maps on these themes, and then you can have a look at one or two of the essay questions as well, write plans for them, and then also write them if you feel ready. This is a tough poem, so make sure that you understand it well, you're confident on it before you attempt an essay. You might want to read some example essays or just read generally more about Pope, more about the poem. Um, if you read about the poem, bear in mind that you're going to be reading about the whole thing, not just this section. So yeah, just uh, make sure that you, you understand that difference. Do read the whole poem if you have time. Pretty long, but worth it. I think I read it probably when I was about 21, the first time I read it. And I was at uni and we were forced to read it and I thought it was brilliant. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoy the full thing as well. So yeah, hopefully I've convinced you that Pope is great. Sorry that it was a slight, slightly messy lesson, but you know, we got there in the end. Um, go to scribbly.com if you need any more help with essay writing or recorded video lessons, tuition, that kind of thing, downloadable documents as well. So yeah, thank you very much for listening. And um, yeah, just in case you're wondering, these pictures in the background, they're the Alps. So he's talking about the Alps, which are a mountain range in Switzerland and France. Um, so yeah, you can kind of see the, the visuals in the background too. So yeah, thank you very much for listening and hopefully I'll see you guys soon in a less messy future lesson. Bye for now.